All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back uh, to another episode of another bourbon show. Tonight, we are going to be drinking another one that amazingly Ryan has not had before. Like, I don't know how in the fuck this is possible, but Stephen, have you had it before? I think so, but it, I'm unclear. I've had several Evan Williams things. I'm certain I've had it, but I okay. can't. I can't say definitively they had them. I'm, I'm certain. Okay. I, well, yeah. oh, go ahead. I, I've had regular Evan Williams and Evan Williams honey, but never mm-hmm. this one. Okay. Well, tonight we're going to be drinking the the top shelf Evan Williams which is still bottom shelf um <laughs> but i mean i guess it's not top shelf because the 1783 the small batch that's getting up there and then they do have the single barrel uh which are fantastic um but tonight we're going to be drinking some evan williams bottled in bond uh being bottled in bond it's obviously a 100 proof liquor uh it's a heaven hill product it is the mash bill is 70 78 percent corn 12% rye and 10% malted barley. Uh super easy to find, super easy to acquire. Uh sub 20 bucks pretty much anywhere you you're, you're going to find it. Um I think I paid 1850 for this bottle. And uh yeah, that's uh charcoal filtered. That's a big selling point right there. They uh made sure to include that on that label. Um but before we do anything else, Wait, Steven, hold on yours. Yours looks a little uh, different than mine. Yeah, that's what mine looks like too, right? Oh. I think Dan's got a slightly older bottle. I might. I didn't know they changed the label. Is yours? Is, okay, yeah, it is green. And I just bought this like last week. Seems Matter like, of fact, in like a week and a half. stock. In a one and a half week time period, I actually bought two bottles of this. And that's one of the reasons why I don't keep this at my house all that much is because I bought a bottle of this prior prior to heading over to my family Christmas. And I expected that that bottle would be good for that night and then I'd have enough left over. But no, Dan instead essentially drank an entire bottle of this himself that night. And it was an ugly, it, that night got real ugly, like like real ugly, but so yeah this is the second bottle of it i bought in like a two-week time period it got real ugly because you looked into a mirror huh (laughs) (laughs) so which one's the new one i think you guys is is the new one i i think shit i don't know it's like uh like it feels nice on the front i don't know can you put yours up to the camera dan Yeah. yeah a little more yeah ours has I think ours have to be newer, but yeah, I would think so. Steven, is there a difference? Would you rate this one differently than the one you got in your hand? No, I think the one that Ryan and I have looks a little bit better. Yeah. But, um, I think the green kind of like that yours, Dan, everything kind of looks the exact same. Like the green separates the label. I feel like a little bit. Yeah, The green, the green on you guys is, is kind of like a belt. Yeah, a little bit. And I think that this label, it kind of looks, it's almost like Monopoly money um, okay. overall. It's just, it's kind of bland. It doesn't really draw you in. You're just like, oh, Monopoly, you know. Uh, I've seen that before. That's kind of your reaction once you see a bottle of this. I think that the Evan Williams as a whole, they look better on a shelf, all kind of next to each other. Like, they're greater than the sum of their parts, you know. Um, and And if you have the entire family lined up, I think that they can look decent because mainly the ones doing the heavy lifting are the flavored stuff, whether it's honey or cherry or all that kind of stuff. It, it does kind of look cool. All the like, all those bottles lined up together because they have a consistent sort of design to them, but they are not that special. Like this is not that special of a bottle. It's mainly white. It's a, I would say it's just a step up pretty similar to one of my lowest so far, which was Jesse James outlaw whiskey. Now that mm-hmm. looked terrible. This doesn't look terrible, but it's very basic. It's like it's it's a lot of white on it, a lot of empty space, kind of a lot of. They could have done some more with it, and even even elements like that charcoal filtered. It's like they ran out of space and were like, "Ah, fuck it, put it on the spine." It's an afterthought, kind of. 
Um, even with the label redesign, they still couldn't find a fucking place for that. Like, regardless of who has the newer one here, <laughs> on both times, on the revision, they never figured out a place to put that. On the other corner, does yours say Genuine Sour Mash? Yes. Yeah. Genuine okay, Sour so that, Mash on the other yeah. side. So at least they kind of bookended it, I guess. But uh, I'm going to be giving this guy a 2 out of 10. It's Ooh, not shit. It's not a good score, but it's not a 1 either. It's not Jesse James Outlaw Whiskey. Um, there is still some element of this that I think is more kind of refined and dignified than a bottle like that, even at something that's 15 bucks. Hmm. So that's my thoughts. Is this another uh, poorly rated Heaven Hill bottle too? It is. You know, Evan Williams, but it reminds me of like Jack Daniels and Jim Beam had a kid and uh, gave birth to a bottle of that. Like, yeah. And I mean, I, and I know they've been around forever, but I feel like it's just a blatant bottle rip off of Jack and Beam morphed into one bottle. If that sort of makes sense. Yeah. Especially that black, especially that black one, like the the regular one. Yeah. It's just like Jack and then with this white label, it looks like Beam. Yeah, one hundred percent. Between the two, you know, I do want to point out one thing though. So the Evan Williams Distillery is, of course, in Louisville, and this is something that I never realized before. And I think that this is a cool piece of nostalgia. So, you know, maybe you guys don't know, but every every distillery is numbered. Okay, and it and there's a there's a distillery number. It's it's entered into uh, Kentucky, like which distillery is one, which one's two, blah 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 blah. Evan Williams Distillery is actually distillery number one. I don't know if you can see it right there, but it's Kentucky one. The one in the oh, I see. It's it's right here. It's right here on the bottom. Okay, they they put it on the front too. Yeah, Yeah. it's on the back as well. And then on in then the Bardstown Heaven Hill Distillery is Distillery Thirty One, but the Evan Williams Distillery in Louisville is Kentucky Distillery One. Now it's not the it's not the first distillery in Kentucky, but it's kind of cool that they are the first one listed as far as numbered distilleries in Kentucky. I think that's kind of fucking cool. It's like that old joke. It's, it goes something like. Uh... Yeah, I'm the first. Are you the best? No, I'm the first. You know, <laughs> it's, it could go both ways. It's like, eh, how much yeah. does it really mean? You know, but it is cool. <laughs> well, before you go any further about whether or not it's the best or not, I think we got to taste it, right? I guess so. And I'll say, even though Ryan was trashing or just pointing out that I was giving it another bad label score for the uh, heaven hill products i think i always pretty consistently rate them highly overall though in terms of the juice inside yeah so, just not the label yeah so we'll see if that holds true here or maybe i'll just trash the whole thing <laughs> i don't think you will i don't think so anyway cheers guys cheers cheers the bar's low i mean this is a cheap <laughs> this is a cheap uh bottle and bond bottle 1850 baby What's the other bottling bond we did recently that was pretty cheap too? In price, maybe I'm just thinking of early times and and Melicorn. uh, Melicorn. Melicorn, yeah. Anyway, what do, you, what do you get on the nose? What do you think of the nose? I get that corn. That corn yeah. comes through pretty good for me. It's all of uh, like just about eight percent corn or whatever. Seventy-eight percent corn and a lot, of, like to me, it's just like that sugary sweetness the caramel the vanilla that is the only thing ryan ever picks up (laughs) it does smell like that it is it's just a it's a really sweet bourbon i bet this smells exactly like what it smelled like pretty much when they started aging it that's what i think it smells like i think if you just opened up that barrel day one i think it smells like this and that's the final outcome i don't think so not that it's bad. I'm just saying it smells like the ingredients of bourbon, like all the okay. discrete ingredients. Wow. That's good. That is sweet. There's like a black pepper at the end. 
a little brown sugar. That's good. It's sweet. It's sweet and spicy. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I think it tastes like a, like a roll in the farm. I think it, uh, <laughs> corn fields, a little hay, a little cow patty. That's what I pick up on the palate. <laughs> Sounds like that Bo Burnham country song from his stand-up. Yeah, there's a scarecrow again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think it's I think it's good. I think it's that it's um there's I pick up a lot of sweetness, then it gives way to the spice at the end, like Ryan's talking about. I agree hundred percent. But I do pick up like an earthy quality that's not necessarily bad, but it's sort of like it's like almost like a grass or a hay. Um, that's what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I won't disagree with any of that. I mean so like the reason I asked you to hold off on whether or not it is or isn't the best is mostly because I think that Evan Williams bottled and bottled in bond punches way higher than its price point. And it's a great old fashioned mixer. Like I drink it neat occasionally but the primarily like the primary reason i have it on my shelf when i have it is to make old fashions with uh it's less expensive than michter's american whiskey which is absolutely my favorite whiskey to use in an old fashioned it's way easier to find it's way less expensive than an eh taylor um but it still has some of those similar characteristics as far as sweetness goes, as far as caramel goes. So it lends itself well to an old fashioned, but you can also sip it neat. And I think it's a great $18 and 50 cent pour. So not saying it's better than the other whiskeys I just labeled, just saying that it does share some of those same characteristics. That's I have to directly compare it to uh, one of my favorite budget bottles and one of my favorites for an old fashioned, which is Wild Turkey 101. Mm -hmm. I think that to me, anytime I'm talking about uh, a bottle at this price point and just kind of one of like the classic brands, um, I tend to gravitate to Wild Turkey and I would rather spend a couple extra bucks, have the Wild Turkey, I think, um, than most of those things. I'll, I'll wait to say how I feel about Evan Williams specifically. But I think I tend to just really like all the notes that you get from Wild Turkey 101. And I think it's a great versatile mixer. Um, and I pick up a lot of that here in terms of, I can see how versatile it would be and you could really put it in anything. It's a great value. And it's like we talked about, it's bottle and bond. I mean, mm -hmm. um, you're not getting, uh, you're not getting penny pinched. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not an 80 proof or watered down. Right. Etc. Yeah. The one thing that I would I'd specify for the folks who have not tried Evan Williams bottled in bond and here a comparison to wild turkey 101. They're not similar profiles. Just to make that clear what Stephen was talking about was uh, the versatility, not necessarily the flavor profile, unless I'm wrong, Stephen. No, you're absolutely right. Okay. All I meant by that was. You know, I, I think you don't you don't really have to have all that many budget bottles lying around. Yeah. It's totally okay to most people don't have like, you know, here's my bottom shelf row that you have, unless you've got as much whiskey as Dan does. But <laughs> um but most people I think you have like kind of like this is like your lower tier couple things, here's your mid tier and here's some like your prized stuff. Yeah. Um and so I, I tend to just like I'm kind of a turkey guy. Yeah. Here. So that's so yeah. I want to share something real quick, though. Uh, the reason I laughed when you said that actually was because I was talking to my sister uh, a couple weeks ago at the family gathering for Christmas. And she showed me the bar of one of her friends. And she thought I was going to be super impressed. And I looked at the picture and I'm not kidding you. He had 130, maybe 150 different bottles of liquor on his shelf. However, I looked at it and I said, he's got a bunch more than me, but my bourbon shelf is way better than his. And she goes, oh, no way. 
And I said, sister, every single one of those bottles is a bottom shelf piece of shit. <laughs> like the, my eyes gravitated straight to a bottle of Jesse James, Stephen. He had a <laughs> bottle of Jesse James sitting there. He ha- and that was like mid shelf on his, on his, like on his shelves. He had like four or five shelves. It was like on the middle shelf. And I was like, Angie, all of this whiskey is like bottom shelf. Like there's nothing special about any of the bottles in this picture. And she thought I was being an asshole because I was drunk. And I was like, I'm not even drunk. I'm being an asshole. Sure. But like, <laughs> like, don't show me that picture and expect me to be excited. Yeah, that's that's the quantity over quality. Yeah, kind of exactly. Virtue. Yeah. And it, like if he never bought another bottle in his entire life, he would still die with 20 bottles of liquor on his shelf. Like he will never be able to drink that much liquor in his entire lifetime. Anyway. (laughs) But then he gets to pass down to his children, you know, some Jim Beam Black label. (laughs) I guess speaking of uh, people passing away, maybe we should mention Bob Saget. Yeah, Jesus. Just happened like 48 hours ago at the time of this recording. Yeah. Oh, I, like, yeah. By the time of the, well, it was yesterday afternoon, wasn't it? No, this was. Oh, you're right. You're right. It was Saturday night. Yeah. You know, or wait. You're right. No. No, I, I think don't it, know was what yes- it was. I think they found him at like four o'clock yesterday. Or yeah. BM. Yeah. Yeah. It was yesterday. It was Sunday. Yeah. That's right. Still sad. Yeah. I saw that post from, uh, uh, who posted that on Facebook about being in his limo? Durham. Uh, Rob Durham. Yeah. yeah, Rob. Yeah. Um, that was a pretty cool story. Yeah. Yeah, he just seemed like a cool dude. You know, and I think I included it in the chat, like listening to him eulog- eulogize uh, Norm MacDonald. Yeah. And he was crying and so emotional, and three months later, he's gone. Yeah. Yeah, and they they said that there was no signs of uh, like drug overdose, no foul play, nothing like that. Just dude's dead. Yeah. Sad. And I think that it's uh, notable how uh, the stark difference between Bob Saget's death and our own Dustin Diamond's death. <laughs> yeah. How mm-hmm. you have so many people that come out and just seem like genuinely upset. And then go back, and I'll just invite you to look up on your own the Dustin Diamond reactions across the internet from different celebrities. You'll see a different shift where even people who seemed the most broken up about Dustin didn't really have a story to tell. Nope. (laughs) Did you guys ever meet Bob Saget? I didn't. In the comedy scene? No. No, I never directly met him. However, I went to, he, he came to SIUE while we were there. I, I didn't go. I, yeah. I don't know why. I went there, and after the show, I met his feature act, Mike Young, who I became sort of uh, Facebook friends with afterwards. But he was very close to Bob, toured with him a lot. And I was kind of waiting the whole time after I heard Bob Saget die to see his post. And he he obviously did make one, and it was, you know, just as sad as you can imagine. And just kind of said, you know, they'd look after – you know, he'd look after the kids and whatnot, but um, it, 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 you could tell from the way that Mike Young liked him that Bob Saget was a great dude. Mm-hmm. It was that kind of, I, I felt like I knew Bob Saget just from all the status updates and stuff he would have with him. And he just seemed like a, just a great guy. You know, there's, there's a ton of people who did not necessarily like Bob Saget's stand-up comedy material because like if you're if all you know about Bob Saget is Full House and uh America's Funniest Home Videos then you do not know anything about Bob Saget as far as being a comedian goes because he is if not the one of the darkest comedians that has ever toured and so there's plenty of people who might say oh i didn't really like his comedy material but i have never ever 
heard anybody say something negative about Bob Saget as an individual. Like as like who he was, everybody loved him. Everybody. It's kind of interesting how he got so many like wholesome roles, whether it's on Full House or like America's Funny Stone Videos. He was always like Or How I Met Your Mother, cat. like the voice. Yeah. Yeah, he was always an American dad casting. Yeah. And um but then you look on the stand up comedy side, it was kinda of like the other the second half of his life where it was like you can just look at the comedians he was friends with, like Norm MacDonald and Artie Lang and those guys, and it's just like you Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah, you can kind of know the kind of ilk that he hung around and what his style was. But it I agree, it is interesting that if you look at the comics mourning the most now. You're just like, oh, those are people that if you never heard his stand up, you'd be like, I had no idea those two knew each other, you know, because you don't see Artie Lang as the American dad. (laughs) No, no. (laughs) Here's what shocked me. And I didn't know this. My wife is I mean, she has a huge crush on John Mayer. She told me that Bob Saget and John Mayer were like best friends. Practically, I had no idea. Um, it, to me, that says a lot more about John Mayer than it does about <laughs> Bob Saget. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, he was just a a, a well loved uh, comedian and artist and uh, Hollywood dude. Yeah, that is sad, man. It's, a lot of guys have been going, man. I mean, I, some of the older guys too, like like Carl Ryan. Uh, Carl Reiner was hilarious too. I think he died last year. Betty White Ed, a week. Betty White. Like, oh Ed yeah, Asner, yeah. Eleven days ago, like. And he gosh, Bob wrote was... like a a tribute about Betty White on his yeah. Twitter. I mean, Betty White. That's a big deal. Like I, I mean, she's ninety nine, so I get it. Fucking, she should have died twenty years. That ago. That People but... Magazine, dude. That fucking cursed her. Did you see that? It was like no. Betty, Betty White, White at 100. Yeah, Betty oh, White I did at see 100. That. And it's like Betty White on her plans for her, like, uh, you know, as she turns 100. And it's like 18 days away, she dies. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, People Magazine. <laughs> and they still published it. Yeah. Oh, a, Jesus. You think they would have been like, yeah, let's scrap that. Let's do a, let's do a piece on Bob Saget. Yeah, <laughs> you'd be like Bob Saget and his Bob Saget's health tips next month on People Magazine. Yeah. The People Magazine curse. <laughs> and John Madden. Yeah, John Madden. <laughs> on this show, we obviously talk about bourbon more than anything else. The second biggest thing we talk about is dead people. Either yeah, people who are dead or that should be dead. Like, what is our fascination? Or people we should have killed in pop yeah. people we should have killed, yeah. <laughs> so what, are we, like, what is our fascination with this? Where does this Bob, come from? Bob Seger is a close third, I think. <laughs> I think that, I think maybe what it is, is whenever, we've talked about this before as well, but like when you're sharing a drink together, I think bourbon brings you together. It makes you aware of the company that you're in the presence of, but it also makes you aware of those that you're not with and the yeah. goals you're missing. So that's, that's maybe almost fucking poetic. <laughs> maybe that's it. Or maybe we just, I, I brought all this up just to say, fuck Dustin Diamond one more time. <laughs> <laughs> I actually deleted his cell phone number out of my phone like a week ago. Oh, I'm not, I'm not kidding you. Like a week ago, I was like, Gee, I still got his cell phone number. I'm deleting this. <laughs> I should have took, I should have sent him one more taint picture. Just. <laughs> well, should, should we go ahead and rate this on a bitch? This is what I was about to say the same thing. Normally I'm about to say it and you say it. So this time I got you motherfucker. Fuck. Fuck. All right. So. Let's start off with Ryan, because Ryan, you know you've never had it before. We're gonna go mm-hmm. Ryan, Steve, and me. Yeah, it's good. You know, I there's a lot of complexity to it, which when you think of Evan Williams, you don't really think about that. It starts off real sweet. You know, you get that caramel, that that vanilla. So I get a little brown sugar, a little chocolatey type type uh taste to it. 
and then it's very spicy at the end. So, um, yeah, it's, it's complex. It, it's not a long finish. You drink it. It doesn't really stay. So you just get another sip down. And then, I mean, I could see why you polished off a bottle and in one night, it's very easy to drink. Uh, I liked it a lot. I'm going to middle score here, seven and a half. Seven, five. Seven five. I liked okay. it. Um, I wish it kind of had those sweeter notes at the end, um, as opposed to like I wish I could add the spice in the beginning and then it cools off with the vanilla caramel brown sugar instead of the opposite, just because that's where my tastes lie a little bit more. But yeah, I liked it a lot. So seven and a half. Yeah, I think uh, seven and a half is wildly high. I think it's wild, but it makes sense for really? now with like the uh, like Will Wheaton from Star Trek haircut. That he's got going on tonight. Uh, it makes a lot okay. of sense to me. Well, it's because I had I had this hat on, and then it was hot in here. My <laughs> furnace is working again. Thank God. Um, Listen, so whatever I the hat up. Whatever you want to say, okay. But either way, the the score is way off here. I'm gonna be giving it a six point seven because I think that it's it's definitely a chunk better than something like a Jim Beam White Label to me. I think it's a a much better value at basically the same exact price, but. I think that I don't put it into the tier of like the seven or above because that's where I think you get into the territory where I would probably put something like a Wild Turkey 101 or an Elijah Craig small batch, which I know is a little bit more expensive, but to me has like much better qualities to it overall from whether it's the nose or the palate or the finish. So I think I'm basically ranking it because I would put it third in that category where it's like Wild Turkey and Elijah Craig kind of right next to each other. And then Evan Williams at a semi-distant third. I still think it's a good value. And I think that there is, uh, there's just genuine value in switching up the stuff you buy from time to time. Don't be so entrenched in what you're, what you get every time uh, at the store, whenever you're looking for that, you know, bottom shelf offering. Don't necessarily always go to the exact same thing. Switch up your staples sometimes. Uh, you might find that you like something even better. But for me, it's a 6.7. Okay. Yeah, I, I do think it, it bats a little higher. There's some about these Heaven Hill, like, 100-proof whiskeys that are just good. <laughs> They're just good. And for the price and the value, I mean, it's hard to beat. Yeah, so I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to start talking about the the flavors that I pick out up a little bit more and what I wish. Okay. So I like, as with what Ryan said, I really wish that the sweetness was on the back end, but the sweetness is right up front and it's overpowering. It's a, it's really, really sweet up front. And then on the back end, you get like the chocolate that Ryan was talking about, but it's like a dark chocolate, like a bitter cho chocolate there is a little bit of bitterness to it sometimes i get a little bit of like a like a doughy flavor to it not every sip but every now and then on the palate i get some doughiness to it overall i think it's a phenomenal pour right like it's really if i was basing it strictly off of the flavor like the flavor the palate the finish it's really good, but it would be like a six, three, right? Because it doesn't have the finish. It doesn't. Yeah. It would be like a six, three, if I was basing it strictly off of the taste, but when you throw in the fact that it's an $18 and 50 cent score, I got to bump that six, three up. I have to, I feel obligated to, and I got to bump it up to a six, seven, just like Steven. Um, I don't think it makes it into the 7.0 range. Uh, even at an $18.50 bottle. Um, but the flavors are good. And the, the flavors you get for the price, like, come on, guys. Like, quit passing up this fucking bottle. Grab a bottle of it. Enjoy it. Quit fucking getting hard on for Buffalo Trace and try some other shit. And this is one of the bottles that you need to try. And, uh, yeah, so I'm at a 6.7, and that's my reasoning. Another bell and shine.